This is Brad Bailey. The date is August 28, 2018. I'm here in New York City. Uh, and this is the oral history interview, the Stonewall Oral History Project with John Noble. Uh, sorry, sorry. Knable. <laughs> sorry, Kna sorry, with John Knable. Knable. Sorry, thank you. Uh, can you pronounce your name and uh, give me your birth date and where you're from? John Knable, birth born on October 17th, 1947 in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And uh, what's, what's Waukesha like? Can you give us a brief description of what the town you grew up in? Sure, were? Waukesha was a very pleasant Midwest town. People said it looked like a movie set, really, who, people who came there for the first time. Because it had been a spa town. There were springs. It was a spring city, and it was a resort town in the late 19th century. And there were a lot of Victorians around. That all died out around the time of the First World War. But the town continued to look like this kind of unusual Saratoga kind of spring city. And uh, it was only about 20,000 people when I was born in, in 1947. But in recent years, it's become a suburb of Milwaukee. And so it's grown to 70,000. So it's not quite the small town that it was when I, when I was born there. And what was your childhood like? Um, <clears throat> well, it was very dominated by the Catholic Church. I was uh, in a very, born in a very religious Catholic family. My older brother uh, is currently a priest. And he went to the seminary about four years before I did. I, uh, I went to the seminary myself and studied to, for five years to become a priest. Uh, as children, we were in the church choir. We served at the, we were altar boys. Uh, we, our, our mentors were sort of the parish priests who looked at both my brother and I as very good candidates for the priesthood. We were sweet kids. Uh, it, it was a different era. And so he was your older brother? Or? Yeah, my older brother, older. five years older. And that was either just the only two of you? Yes, uh, just the two boys. What did your parents do? My father worked for the railroad. He was uh, a, a conductor on the Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul and Pacific Railroad. My mother was a housewife. And quiet little, t little town. Quiet little town. And so, uh, Except I'd say that, you know, when I was about 13, one of the, when just becoming aware of my sexuality, I mean, I was always sure that I, that I was attracted to men. And you know, at, at about age 13, 14, when you start realizing that you're a little different from the other kids around you, there was a big uh, gay sex scandal in Waukesha. And this, I mean, I hadn't talked about gay anything at the time, but um, in the downtown park, there was a men's room and the police learned that there was some activity there after midnight. So for three nights, they did a sting. And then on the Monday, that was Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, the whole town was shocked because the whole front page of the local newspaper was about the 20 plus men that had been arrested for lewd conduct in the in men's room in Frames, Frame Park in Waukesha, Wisconsin. It was this shocking thing. And it was my, what is this, you know, I read everything about it. It went on for weeks with the trials. You know, they listed, as you, as you know that they would, the full names, addresses, and ages, and occupations of all the men that were arrested. And so I'd say that some of the first important information I had about being gay and something that I was beginning to feel in myself was it's dangerous. And what's this, you know, what's this all about? One was, uh, there was a local dentist. There was a priest. There was a hospital administrator, uh, a bunch of married men as well as single men. Uh, and within a few weeks, the hospital administrator committed suicide, another front page headline. Uh, so I have to say it was, it was a, something I remember very, very, very strongly. And uh, you know, it made it a little afraid. How old were you again uh, around? That? About 13. About and um, so I guess then for your teenage years, how much of an impact did that and other things have on you being able to express your sexuality in some way? Well, I, I would say that I do remember going to the public library and looking up homosexuality in the card catalog because I needed to get some information about this and I wasn't able to talk to anybody about it. Um, <clears throat> and it was all, they did have a few books, but of course they were all very negative. They were in the, uh, uh, the medical section and it was about the disability of homosexuality and penal, penal codes and all that kind of stuff. So, but as a young seminarian uh, in the seminary, not that gay was ever mentioned, but I became very interested in cultural things. And you know, there were certainly 
uh, gay, gay authors. There was uh, Gertrude Stein and Oscar Wilde and Tennessee Williams and uh, Andy Warhol, and, you know, as the years went by, who was, uh, it became in the general uh, uh, public world, I, I learned that there were other gay people around, you know, so it took a while, but, you know, it was very attuned to what, what was going on in the, in the big world, even though I still couldn't talk to anybody about it. And so when did you start the seminary? What you, what, how old were you when you started the seminary? High school. I high was school. 13. 13. Okay, sorry, 13. So it was a high school, I guess. Cause I high had... school, yeah. There's, it's a 12-year program. High school, college, and four years of theology, followed by ordination, and people and priests begin there. there. Oh, wow. So from 13 to 25. Uh-huh, oh, wow. right. So can you tell me a bit about <clears throat> that experience up to high school and then graduating from there? Well, <clears throat> I left the seminary after five years, and I left the church at the same time. I felt it was a very negative experience. Um, <clears throat> uh, how to even begin to talk about it, because it's so long ago, but um, the, um, I didn't think that the, the, uh, the strict rules, the, uh, I mean, it was a strange, a, a strange part of being in the seminary, for instance, was that we were forbidden to have women friends. Uh, as soon as at age 13 and you were in an all-male environment with priests, this whole male culture, it was in the rule book that should we ever be caught writing a letter to a female friend, it was grounds for immediate expulsion. There is a, a, a strange indoctrination not only of the religion but of a whole religious culture that we see these days in the you know, in the pedophilia and the sexual abuse stories that are in the newspapers today, of these, this strange culture. Um, I would say that a lot of gay boys are attracted to their religious life because it means they're not going to be any, any pressure to have girlfriends. Uh, I think I escaped a good deal of uh, pressure and uh, bullying in grade school even because everybody said, oh, that's John. He's religious. He's going to be a priest. Leave him alone. So if he doesn't play sports and he's not one of the guys, it's because he's, he's going to be this spiritual guy. We respect priests and they can be a little different. I think that's true me, of me and of many other gay men that ended up in the priesthood. It was a path that you could take that seemed to free you from some of the pressures of the, the masculine indoctrination that you were exposed to. And you said you were there for five years, so that would have placed you at 18 years old right. uh, when you <clears> left from there. Why did you decide to leave? Well, <clears throat> some, well, I felt I didn't fit in. Uh, you know, I, I really lost my faith. The, uh, the religion just somehow didn't ring true. I was in, I just was interested in, in the big world and, and, and just kind of grew up in an in a intellectual and, and emotional way that I said, well, this just isn't me. I, I need to get out of here, go to college, and have a different life. How did your parents respond to that? Well, because my older brother stayed in the seminary and he ultimately became a priest, I think I had more freedom from the kind of the direction they wanted us to follow because, you know, they had one already. It would have been an honor, they thought, to have two, both of their sons become priests. But at a certain point when I started talking about how unhappy I was, etc., that they both um, said that it was fine. They, they accepted that. But then I went off. I left home. I went directly. I had been, had been in boarding school and not living at home since I was 13. So at 18, then I went 60 miles away to the University of Wisconsin in Madison, which in those days was a hotbed of anti-Vietnam War protest and as a already a liberal progressive kind of guy, I got very involved in the anti-war movement. Uh, Madison was a hotbed, of, as I say, of anti-war sentiment in colleges in the United States at that time. And uh, for instance, one of our famous protests, the Dow Chemical protest, where it was a big sit-in at the at the business school, I was sitting in the hallway when the uh, national the pre, the police arrived and and with Billy Clubs, about 70 students were hospitalized after this, and uh, it became a big national incident. The school was closed two days, two years in a row because of the uh, disorder on campus, the being tear gassed. I mean, it, it was really wild years. And so did you, um, 
did you graduate? So did you come, what was your, did you come out at, at Madison or what was your, what was that situation? Well, I had gay friends. We were all, uh, <clears throat> no one was having any sex in those days. I think I should take a drink of water. <clears throat> yeah, I, and I hate to be running through this part. <laughs> That's all right. No, stuff. we should we should hurry. It's good stuff. <clears throat> actually, it really is. It's fascinating. Do you ever have oral histories that go into that in detail? Ultimately? No, actually. Uh -uh. I love the seminary example of how you're right. Like if you go to seminary, this sort of gives you a pass from having you know some of the issues that other kids might have. have. Yeah. Um, yeah, so can you tell me a bit, you, you mentioned that, uh, what was gay life like for you and for other people at Madison? Um, so I was a comparative literature major, uh, and I, I did have some friends from the seminary who, who were also gay men that joined me at the University of Wisconsin, and we made other friends. Um, we were clearly out, uh, aware of our, of our being gay, but again, there was a, a there was an, a total absence of any recognition of gay or lesbian students on campus. This is prior to Stonewall, prior to the, the modern gay rights movement. Um, there was not even any any gay corner in uh, the cafeteria or something. We were really just uh, lone people. So I mean, there was so there was no no place to uh, to gather to to get to to get to know more people. I mean, I had this small set of friends and uh, we weren't quite sure what we were going to do about our sexuality, um, uh, although we were clearly all gay guys. And you said that nobody was having sex? That's right. Okay. And why was that? <clears throat> well, we were friends. We weren't going to have sex with our friends. And uh, it, the, as I say, it was like, uh, I don't know, it just wasn't permitted. It wasn't, it didn't seem like we were we were ready or able to do anything. Um, uh, <clears throat> there would be films from time to time. Like I remember an important film for me uh, came out in 1969, just when I was getting ready to graduate, was Midnight Cowboy with Dustin Hoffman and, and uh, uh, John Voight. And, and uh, although if you look at the film now, it looks like it has a pretty negative message about being gay. There's, uh, you know, the one is a hustler and he beats up his John and, and it, it's all pretty negative. But to me, I was thinking, gosh, I got to get to New York. There's a gay life there. They, you know, they, they went to a, a, a club and they, the Warhol set were there. And it was like, I, I, I viewed it totally different. It was full of very important information for me. And that was the case about other things I'd heard about New York or San Francisco, that there might be a place somewhere that I could go, that I could become a, become a, a real person. And that's so, a great segue. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so I applied to about 15 graduate schools because I just didn't know uh, <clears throat> where I was going to be accepted. So I, I applied to many schools on the West Coast, the East Coast, and the Midwest, you know, Illinois and Indiana and Michigan and Minnesota and NYU and Columbia, and I got accepted by almost everybody, which was great. But it gave me my opportunity then to say, I'm going to go to NYU, uh, so, uh, in <clears throat> which, which was not only because I wanted to uh, get my doctorate in comparative literature because I thought I was going to become a college professor. It was really my, uh, my, uh, my goal at that time, continue my studies, but also to get to this big city. And so once you and so you got to NYU and so did you? Uh, how did your parents take that? What, what did you say? Oh, they were very supportive. Okay. And uh, so you, I guess, that fall, then you moved to New York. So what? Go ahead. Um, yeah, I made my first trip to New York in the first week of July to begin to look for housing. School wasn't going to begin until the beginning of September, but I needed to find a place to live. So um, I did go to go to New York and the, stayed at a hotel. And um, you know, started to look around the city, and, and indeed, I checked into NYU housing, and I was I was doing all of that. But at the same time, I walked around the village, Greenwich Village. You know, you, sorry, I'm sorry, sorry, and what year was that again? 
1969, July of 69. I heard nothing about a police raid on Stonewall the week before until I was walking uh, uh, by um, Washington Square in the NYU student area and someone handed me a flyer inviting me to uh, join a march the following weekend uh, to protest the police raid at the Stonewall Bar. Um, and it was like, oh, well, I, I didn't go, uh, but I thought that's very interesting. Oh, there's, there's, there's some kind of gay, gay uh, political activity, something's happening. Um, so that I, very, I remember, and I was thinking, you know why I remembered it? Because I said, how did, they, how did they know I was gay? To hand me this flyer. <laughs> I guess that was a little obvious, but anyway. Um, so, Why do you say that? Well, people have always spotted me right away as gay. I start a new job, and two people come over and say, You're gay, aren't you? It's like, you know, I never was somebody that passed easily. Uh, and that's okay. It, uh, you know, I wasn't like flamboyant or anything, but the, obviously I, I just come across to people that know gay people as I'm one of the gay people, so, and that's fine. I'm kind of happy about that. Um, yeah, so, but in the subsequent weeks then, uh, going to camp, uh, go, being on campus, and um, I went to my first gay bar, which was uh, the Hippodrome on Avenue A. Uh, it was uh, kind of a hippie bar. Allen Ginsberg was there one night. I started to make gay friends. Um, <clears throat> and um, one of my friends, Tom Finley, who had been attending the early Gay Liberation Front meetings, uh, he said, you know, you're such a political guy because we talked about my anti-war protest stuff and, and my general politics. Um, and he said, you should come with me to this meeting. So I went to my first Gay Liberation Front meeting. It was about six months after the Gay Liberation Front had formed. Can you give me, so you got there in around July of mm -hmm. 1969, and did you leave at all or did you just stay? You said you went to... Right, I went. I found a somewhere to live, so I went back to uh, Waukesha for about a month, okay. and then I returned permanently in August. All right. So, so when you got there, we're gonna get. I'm gonna get to the gay liberation in a second, but mm -hmm. when you got there in early July, what what was the sort of atmosphere like? You mentioned that. Did you hear about this, the riots at all on the news or anything? Or not at all. Right, no. So, so when was the first time you heard about? It was it? this flyer that I was handed that announced that? I mean, it said I should join a protest march about. You know, and it, it said, join your gay sisters and brothers at this protest march. And so that's the first I heard that there was any incident that was of interest and, and, uh, and people were responding to it. And it was, that was in, I said, I mean, I guess I felt like, oh yeah, it's almost like an anti-war march. There's somebody getting together and, and having a march about this thing. So, uh, of course, retrospectively, then I knew, I've I surely learned an awful lot about it in the six, six months later when I joined Gay Liberation Front. And tell me, and so you uh, you were invited by um, invited by what's his name again? Tom Finley, a Tom good Finley. friend of mine who was already attending. Um, there was a core group of, of some were at Stonewall. Uh, some of the people who started the Gay Liberation Front were actually at Stonewall that night, like um, Mark Siegel and. Uh, I mean, there's a there's a, a, a handful of people who then uh, Marty Robinson, uh, Marty Robinson apparently was telling there were a few people that had been in the Mattachine Society, a group called the Action Group of the Mattachine Society, who were much more uh, leftist and, and politically active than the homophile organization was in general, and. They were already eager to do something a little bit more public uh, than Mattachine had allowed them to do. So they had access to this uh, mimeograph machine at, at Mattachine's offices. They s kind of snuck in, pretended that they were not doing anything in particular, and they ran off these flyers. And, and uh, so it was the, uh, Stonewall was the end of June. Uh, within the next month, they leafleted people in the village. They had an open public meeting about this at one of the churches, uh, and at the uh, <clears throat> and they organized this march for a certain day. 
and about 300 people showed up. Uh, they gathered at Washington Square, and it was to march to Sheridan Square to the location where the Stonewall was sitting there all closed. Uh, you know, it was never open when I was in New York. It was always this closed up bar with some damage on the front of it. And so it never reopened as a bar, as far as I know, after the, after the riot, maybe a short time. But basically it was closed after that. So the going to protest uh, and get some public uh, notice for the, the ongoing police raids. I mean, this was not the only police raid that had been on a bar, but it had been the one that had created the stir and people had responded and, you know, taken action. Um, uh, so, I mean, the, there's an awful lot of attention and rightfully paid to the Stonewall Rebellion, to those three nights of rioting, to talk about this as one of those outpouring of angers that were extremely important. But a lot of those people then weren't political people. There was this other group who recognized it was an opportunity to take some action, much smaller. As I say, some of them were at Stonewall and participated you in the mean riot. The GLF. The GLF. GLF. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sorry, the GLF. Yeah. Um, so, uh, it was these folks who uh, organized the march who then said, on Sunday night, let's have an open meeting. And the open meetings uh, started at a place called Alternate U, which was a, a sort of a, a leftist gathering place on the corner of 14th Street and, and uh, 6th Avenue. And uh, that's where the organization first started having its meetings, open to the public. Um, and people really came out of the woodwork and started, kind of started uh, joining. A, a huge uh, cross-section of what the gay community was like in New York at that time. But obviously this had a very, these people had a very kind of radical uh, approach to what should be done, a clear break with the homophile groups that had preceded them. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Is this sort of where? We're... Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. No, just keep, <clears throat> keep going. You're, 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 you're nailing it. So, and, <clears throat> I, would, I guess the, discuss the homophile groups, who those groups were, and they will just keep it. <clears throat> okay. So, active in New York time at that time, the Mattachine Society was really the the uh, the, the major homophile group, um, Mattachine. A kind of a pseudonym, some name that somebody had picked up, like the lesbian group Daughters of Belitis. These were, they, they, they used names that were not apparent what they were doing. Um, people uh, took a lot of, I mean, they, they took a lot of courage. They risked their jobs, et cetera, have small actions like they did in Philadelphia uh, at the Liberty Bell on uh, July 4th every year. They marched and talked about homosexual rights. Um, but uh, it was not anything that was really uh, bringing a community out and together. So um, the Gay Liberation Front chose these, this name absolutely on purpose. Gay, not gay, and lesbian. Those words were used immediately, and that was the first gay groups that had used gay and lesbian openly, and not those uh, uh, pseudonyms of the homophile movie movement. Liberation, because this group was not going to be satisfied with some kind of acceptance that was going to take a long time. This was like full rights, liberation, we're here, we're queer, we're, you know, we are who we are, and we're, we're not in the closet. And thirdly, front, because it was an umbrella group, and it just, it was an umbrella group. There was a, a sense that there was a, some uh, notion of the name taken from the uh, Vietnamese National Liberation Front. But the front name really meant we're an umbrella. We're going to uh, really encompass a diverse, diverse group of people. And in fact, from the very beginning, we had gay men and we had lesbians. We had African Americans. We had Hispanics. We had Asians. We had transgender people, although we called them drag queens at the time. Um, and so this, this amalgam was there talking. Uh, uh, those first months were all about uh, developing a politics borrowing a lot of things from the women's movement, borrowing a lot of things from the civil rights movement, and, and uh, 
conceptualizing it as what can we do as gays and lesbians to change our lives. And so can you, um, I, and this is great because it's good to get that overview, but I'm curious about what your role specifically was when, when he invited, uh, when Tom Finley invited you to that meeting, I guess in like early 1970, <clears throat> what was your experience like and what was your role in GALF from that point forward? And then, and also just what type of evolution did you sort of undergo personally uh, with regard to your own sexuality and personal relationships and things like that? <clears throat> the main thing I remember about my first Gay Liberation Front meeting was that I recognized immediately two people from my classes at NYU in comparative literature, in, in uh, Carla J., who, and Alan Sample, uh, but Carla has been a very uh, well-known uh, participant in Gay Liberation Front and a whole life as a, as a lesbian activist. Um, so we introduced ourselves and they said, we thought you were gay. And uh, well, they'd seen me at class too. And uh, I had uh, found housing with a straight roommate. And uh, shortly thereafter, I came out to my straight roommate because I was, you know, I was feeling, feeling my oats. And he said, well, I have no objection to that, but I want you to move out as soon as possible. So here I am six months in, in New York, seven months in New York, and I'm losing my place already. So I mentioned this to Carla and Alan when I saw them at class. And Carla says, oh, we have an extra, extra bed at our apartment. You should move in with us. So uh, within like two weeks, I moved in with, with Carla and Alan at their apartment on the Upper West Side. And of course, then immediately, I'm in a gay environment with people who are already engaged in the Gay Liberation Front and uh, became extremely active and involved. Yeah, that's good stuff. <laughs> like that's, that's the stuff we want to get to, which is sort of how, what was your <clears throat> personal experience? Um, So during this time, I did have my first actual sexual encounters. So these, th I mean, it's like I came out in the movement is one of the things I, I say to people because it was after I'd gone to my first Gay Liberation Front meeting that I met some guys and I, I went home and I actually had wonderful sexual uh, encounters with new people who, uh, you know, were similar to me and, and a very exciting period of coming out and um, uh, rejoicing so happy, really, just like, oh, my life is blooming now. It was hard to pay attention to my classes because I was uh, socializing and, and going to meetings. And the Sunday night meetings were, of course, a central focus for the Gay Liberation Front. Um, everybody got up and spoke about what's happening, what we should be doing. There were disagreements. There was a, um, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of actions were planned. Um, and now, before I had joined the group, uh, in the previous November, several Gay Liberation Front lesbians had joined a man named Craig Rodwell, who owned the Oscar Wilde bookstore, which was a pioneer gay bookstore in New York, had come up with the idea that we should um, uh, celebrate or honor or commemorate the Stonewall Rebellion with a, uh, a gay pride march in New York. Uh, on the one-year anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion. So when I joined GLF, there was already talk and planning. They had gone to, it's interesting, they had gone, there was an existing group called ERCO, the Eastern Regional Homophile Organization. And it was a, it was a kind of a formal gathering of the homophile groups on the East Coast from Buffalo, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, and they were having a conference in November where everybody was supposed to come. And the representatives from Gay Liberation Front went to Philadelphia for this ERCO meeting in November and proposed the Gay Pride March to the group. They were very uncomfortable with the idea because it seemed too public. It was a real break with the kind of uh, more, more under the, under, uh, under the notice. This was going to get a lot of publicity. But they approved it. Erco, at the end, after all the people talked about it, they endorsed the march. So we had this Eastern Regional Group that was going to be behind it. But within a month, they disbanded. 
they disbanded, and it was a very kind of um, what can you call it? It was a it was a clear transition from the era of the homophile groups to the new era of gay liberation. My voice just goes. No, so sorry. You're doing great. <laughs> Are you going back there? Yeah. <laughs> this is the good stuff. Do you want another thing of water? Or... Mm -hmm. I think ginger ale is always good. Oh, that's good too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <coughs> That'll be good because it'll help your throat uh, mm -hmm. with the. Um... But no, this is great. I hope you're not. Yeah, you're good. I'm good. Yeah. I'm just, you know, like. <clears throat> hope I'm not. No, you're fine. You're fine. I just again, I just keep. I want to hear all of it. So. Okay. You know, and you're nailing it because again, like it's important because it's that's why I want you into the weeds. With because you were perfect with that with the with the groups around that period of time, and just with who they were and how they interacted with each other, and then how you interacted personally with all of that. Like, and you're you that's it. That's okay. The core of, of Good. You're doing that. So. Um, yeah, and about what what year was that generally when um, when Airco? November of sixty nine. Okay, so that was November. Okay, got it. Okay, well, I think the ginger. Oh, this one maybe. Oops, it's fine. But it probably this. One. Oh, do you want to do the ginger ale instead? Well, that's what we suggested. Yeah, because yeah, it'll help his throat. Yeah. yeah, you think it'll help it better? Oh, okay. Because yeah, ginger ale is healing. Good. I should have brought a Ricola or something, but that's all right. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Am I running? No, it's a little late. I'm, I'm recovering from a cold. It is. It's good, though. Take your hand off. Okay. No, Thank you. Does that help? Tastes good. <laughs> <clears throat> so where we where were we now? Uh, you Let's talked about Erico. All think right. You mm -hmm. said that you were finishing up. Um, you were mentioning how they were about to, they, there was like a, they had usually were under undercover, but now right. there was this event that could put them a bit more than the public eye, so. We said that was November 69, then we could skip, we could skip around to this, because I want to hear it right before, that, that six months was crucial, I guess, from January 70 to June of 70, and then. Uh, you mentioned like your personal life with that, so you could probably talk about Erico and then jump to um, whatever you feel like. But um, yeah, like that that sort of period, that one year anniversary date, and what happened around it. So and then we go we go from there. So. <clears throat> so I think I was describing this period uh, where I was attending meetings. I really came out, I had sex for the first time, and, and all of this stuff was coming together, and I was making many more friends in the Gay Liberation Front, attending meetings and thinking about how uh, I was going to become active, much more active in the group. Um, uh, and so I was very excited about the prospect as we approached uh, the end of June 1970 of participating with my friends in, in, in Gay Liberation Front in the first Gay Pride March, which we called the Christopher Street Liberation Day March. Uh, Christopher Street Gay Liberation Day March is what its official name was. Um, and uh, so, uh, interesting enough, there I am an NYU student. NYU had uh, a gay student group that had formed in January of 1970, and as the, the uh, first Gay Pride weekend came along, they scheduled a, a gay and lesbian student dance on the NYU campus. Um, <clears throat> it was held in the basement of Weinstein Hall, which is a dormitory on University Place right near the Washington Square Park, central to the, uh, the, the NYU campus. And uh, I went with four friends, with Tom Finley, with whom I was still very close, and his partner, and two others. Uh, Peter Ruffett and Miles Brown, and we went to the dance that night, and we had a great time. I remember arriving at like nine o'clock on campus. Uh, we lived on the Upper West Side, and uh, had a great evening. They had played all the all the the current music, the Supremes, and you know we all danced, 
And about one o'clock, the five of us decided it was time to go home, go catch the subway to uh, the Upper West Side. And so we headed up University Place across 14th Street. You sort of have to know New York City geography, but we were heading over to the 7th Avenue subway. Uh, it was about one in the morning, as I say, and uh, very quiet. There was still some traffic on the street, and the five of us were walking. I wasn't holding hands, but the other two were couples, so I think they were holding hands, and we were just in a great mood, not paying any attention to anything. And as we crossed the street, a car started yelling at us, faggots, faggots, and it was like, what, who are those people? They drove on, and we kind of forgot about them. We crossed the 14th Street, we were heading toward the subway. Unbeknownst to us, they had turned the car around, let out two of the four guys behind us. The others drove up ahead of us and parked, and all of a sudden we heard these people running toward us. Two big bruisers coming down the street and two big guys coming up behind us. And it was like, uh, wow. Uh, I remember I was holding an umbrella, which I threw on the, on the ground. And then before I knew it, this guy had come and he picked me up by the collar of my, my shirt collar and my belt and he smashed me into the sidewalk. Um, and um, I had a very, very bad concussion. My, uh, my forehead was split open and I was knocked unconscious. Uh, they continued to beat up my friends uh, and there was, they fought back, and there was a fight that kind of went down the street, and a police car arrived, and everybody, there were some passers-by that said, stop, they attacked these guys. And of course, I didn't know anything, because I was, I was unconscious on the street. I mean, I remember waking up for a moment, and putting my hand to my head, and seeing all this blood, and then I saw the blood was running toward the curb, so I passed out again. <laughs> Apparently, when the police stopped the fight, they said, where's John? And it turned out that I was still mid-block. And uh, so, uh, <clears throat> and the uh, Peter Ruffin, his ankle was broken. They, they weren't injured at all, the, the bruisers. So um, anyway, the police arrested us all. They said, when there's a fight, we, it's not our, it's not our uh, role to decide who started it. As far as we, we see a street brawl, you're all going to the, the station. But um, Peter and I were ambulanced to uh, Bellevue, and I had 14 stitches through my head, and it was like about 3.30. They brought us back to the uh, Charles Street uh, station, and all the bruisers and us were sitting there, and they said, we're going to go before the judge, and they were about to put us in the, in, in the uh, jail for the night. And we kept saying, we kept telling them the truth about the incident. And uh, so they said, well, you know, if you want to file civil charges against these guys, we could, uh, we could go that route. Uh, you give us, show us your driver's licenses, and we'll give those names to those fellows, and we'll give you their names. So we saw them across, we agreed to that. So, I mean, going on 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, we uh, saw them uh, copying things down from the driver's license of the attackers, and we gave them our names. Uh, so then we were let go. We, we, they said, you can go first. We'll hold them here for 20 minutes so there's no further problem. And so we hurried off to the subway and went away. We hired an attorney and we served the subpoenas to the names and addresses we were given. All the subpoenas came back. They were fake names and no such addresses. So the police had cooperated with these guys and let them go scot-free. It took a few months for this all to really work its way out. And of course, there was no case. There were nobody that we could uh, uh, take action against. Uh, that's the kind of treatment that one that gay people got on, when they were beaten up on the street. So that was Friday night, and the, the march was on Sunday. So no way we were going to miss it. Um, <clears throat> and this was right before the one-year anniversary of Stonewall. Right. So uh, for the first gay pride march, we pushed Peter Ruffett in a wheelchair up 6th Avenue in the march. I had a great big patch uh, over my, my head. And uh, so we, we marched from uh, the village up to Central Park with the group. And uh, I have to say it was one of the happiest days of my life. And what would you say, to tell me about that and, you know, and describe why you said that to me. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, well, you know, the first Gay Pride March was a, although there had been pre-protests against the Village Voice, the, uh, the Snake Pit Raid, which was a whole story in itself. It happened in March of that year. There, were, there was a lot of activity, but this was a culmination of a, of a kind of a very positive statement. We hope that, that a lot of people would show up. Would, does this, would that show up if we? Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, and we could also get a separate shot of it. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Hold it like that. Which one's oh, I will. I'll talk one about one it. Mine has got a yeah, camera. Yeah. We can snap a shot of it. Okay. That's we'll awesome. Take a spot off do you have a digital copy of this? Yeah, I have. Oh, I do. Uh -huh. yeah. It's on my phone. Huh? You have other photos? Well, yes, I have two more, actually. This is from the 24th, I mean, the 25th anniversary reunion in 1994. Okay. I had. I had the Gay Liberation Front banner recreated at a, mm. at a company, and I brought it to New York, and we carried it. 25th. This was in the 25th, and this is in the 45th, just in 2014, 13. Wow. Yeah, so, and this is, I, know I carried it in this year's March as well, wow. so this is cool. a real a continuity. Uh-huh. Yeah. My hair gets white. <laughs> <laughs> My hair gets cut. Actually, I, I had it much longer after this. It was, it was down here, and I used to have to brush it all the time. That was the Gay Liberation Front look. Long hair. But this one would be... Well, if you could, yeah, show those. Okay, cool. Yeah, if you could... Okay, cool. Yeah. That's fine. Um, okay. I'm recovering from a cold. No. Which is partly why my voice is uh, no, cracking. So, <clears throat> so uh, before we finish the discussion of the um, sort of liberation, but what was the snake pit? Um, well, you want to go back to that, or you want to get to the march? Well, we'll, we'll finish the march. Yeah, we'll finish the march. Get to the march. We'll the march. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the march committee really consisted at that time mostly of members of the Gay Liberation Front, with a few other people that were active in those days, but. Uh, it was very uncertain whether or not we were going to march with a permit from the police or not. And the permit for the, this uh, first Gay Pride March was only issued on Friday before the Sunday march. Uh, so we actually did have a, a parade permit that was finally uh, issued to the organization to have this uh, street march. But we, we had hoped that we would have some, some route that made sense. We did march from the village to Central Park up 6th Avenue, but um, the police only gave us one lane of traffic. So, uh, the, uh, so for that whole long trek from the village up to uh, 57th Street where we entered Central Park, we were confined to one lane of traffic. There was the parked cars in place all the way up 6th Avenue. Then we, we had the first lane, and the traffic, the usual 6th Avenue traffic, was just barreling up and next to us. So uh, that caused us to be kind of really a long and narrow march in anywhere you were. You couldn't really see how many people were ahead of you or behind you. There was a lot of uh, tension because people thought, maybe we're going to be attacked. This has been publicized. Are we going to have some... I mean, I'd just been beaten on the streets, so, you know, you, you'd, it's not a fantasy that there could have actually been some, some uh, attacks or... or uh, people occasionally did shout at us, because some people were... We were carrying gay liberation and come out of... Our, our iconic slogan that was, was um, out of the closets and into the streets. It made so much more... So much sense to be saying that at the Gay Pride March to the assembled masses as we went by. Come on, out of the club. You have to. We have to organize. We have to become public. And that's what this was all about. So uh, uh, out of the closets into the streets was absolutely the right slogan for that first gay pride march. Um, <clears throat> uh, so as we entered Central Park, where we intended to get to the Sheep's Meadow and kind of disperse, um, we were, I, as I walked along, and I was maybe in the first third. It turned out I was kind of in the first third of the, of the line of march, not really where, but 
when we got there. There were already, at the end of the sheep's meadow, there was a, a hill, a small hill. And as we were walking up towards the group, they were all turned around and they were just going crazy. They were all applauding, etc. And they kept saying to us as we were kind of arriving, turn around, turn around, they kept saying to us. So we turn around and we, we saw exactly what they were excited about. It was a long way across Sheep's Meadow and you couldn't believe how many people were there. It was as it, the, the, the tally is always somewhere between three and 5,000 marchers. And as they were coming in, the crowd was just, we couldn't believe it. It really was the largest uh, gathering of gays and lesbians in the world, I think, that had ever happened at that time. And I was very fortunate that my friend Tom Finley, with whom I was, <laughs> his name keeps coming up, had a camera in, and he took this wonderful picture of me. And I think this is one of the happiest moments in my entire life as I looked and saw that crowd behind. The Gay Liberation Banner is in the background and I recognize people like Bob Kohler and other Gay Liberation Front members with me and just so happy. What a day. And so um, what was the, and that being the one year anniversary of Stonewall and essentially, <coughs> do, you, do you think that was considered the first Gay Pride March of the modern era, do you, do you think? Well, you could very well claim that, that that March of 300 from Washington Square to Sheridan Square one month after the Stonewall Rebellion could be considered the first march. Um, we did participate as a group in anti-war marches with the Gay Liberation Banner. So between, uh, in that first year, before you got to June of 1970, there were other uh, marches that we joined, but you know, this was our biggest and best. Um, it, it rightfully really is the, the at, as the anniversary of, of Stonewall. It, it's uh, iconic. It's, it's really, the, that's the reason we have uh, 49 years later, all of these uh, gay pride marches that are all over the world. I mean, just incredible. There's like, a, I think there's a, there are hundreds of cities around the world now that celebrate the end of the last Sunday in June as, as Gay Pride Day. Uh, it's one of our major achievements uh, as a group, as a Gay Liberation Front, to have established this, this march that you know, spread all over the world and is, is still there with us today. And we expect three to four million people in New York this year. Compared with that 3,000 to 5,000 we had the first year, it's, it's really wonderful. And um, so after the march, what was your life like? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the next open Sunday meeting, the following week, people said we should get up and talk about our gay bashing. So I was the spokesperson for the five of us, and I addressed the group. It was the first time I'd actually gotten up and, and talked to the whole group. Maybe, and we, by that time we were so large, we had moved to a church on Ninth Avenue. Uh, when we were using uh, the, uh, the basement of their community hall. And it held maybe three to 400 people, and that's, we would have the three to 400 people come on Sunday nights to these open meetings. Um, so I spoke about the gay bashing, et cetera. And uh, after the meeting, these uh, three guys approached me and said that they, you know, they, the three of them had started uh, uh, living together uh, in a living collective. Uh, it was the first uh, Gay Liberation Men's Living Collective uh, in an apartment on, on uh, West 95th Street near West End Avenue, and they were wondering if I would be interested in moving in with them. Uh, I had been living with Carla J for some months, and in fact it really didn't seem to make sense to me at that point. It was, it was time to give her her space back, and the notion of having a Gay Living Collective, which was really a, just a little cell of gay men who would share, share an apartment and do consciousness raising and plan actions, et cetera, was very appealing to me. So within a, f with a few weeks after that, I joined uh, the 95th Street Living Collective. That's how my life changed. So my life really changed at that point because um, 
we were the first, but very soon uh, about six other gay men's living collectives formed out of the Gay Liberation Front on 23rd Street, on 17th Street, on East 9th Street, on Baltic Street in Brooklyn. Um, what had happened with the Gay Liberation Front was that the Sunday night meetings, although they were a tremendous forum for political thinking and planning uh, open uh, events, we wanted, to, and we did, we formed working cells, a working cell that put on gay dances at uh, alternate at a place called Alternate U as an alternative to going to the gay bars. Uh, <clears throat> the Come Out Collective published the Come Out newspaper, uh, which started already in 1969. We published, they published seven issues before the group disbanded. Um, the, uh, so a whole bunch of working cells evolved to actually do the work of the organization. One group searched for a space for a community center. Um, our group was very instrumental in starting consciousness raising groups for gay men to discuss, uh, to give testimony and try to evolve a politics from personal experience around gay liberation. Um, <clears throat> we actually also installed a telephone in, in our, uh, in our uh, apartment, which we listed with the New York Public Telephone Company uh, as the Gay Liberation Front number. Um, we actually had a hard time with the, with the telephone company. They refused to uh, list us in the book because we used the word gay. <clears throat> but after um, numerous phone calls and a personal visit, they agreed to list us. So we, um, we didn't realize how much work it was going to be finally to have a a telephone for the Gay Liberation Front, we began to get dozens and dozens of calls a day. We took turns, we had a, we had a desk with the telephone, and we, we formed a speakers bureau. We um, brought people to consciousness raising groups. We told them about the dances. It was like, it was what you would have a, a website for today, when it was all personal. And we got calls in the middle of the night from frightened kids upstate New York that wanted to come out, and it was really a burden. So. Some months later, when the uh, uh, organization finally started its own community center, we were happy to move the telephone to uh, the office on uh, West Third Street, where the uh, Gay Liberation Front finally established a community center. Um, <clears throat> what else? No, I keep not having to. I know, I'm thinking. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's see if we could go back to the snake pit. Oh, no, it's fine. I, I love where we're going now. Oh, okay. Uh, what, um, what did you, all right, so what, around what time, uh, you said that was uh, January, I guess, June 1970, when did you move to the collective on 95th, 95th Street? Uh, in July of 1970. So literally a month later. Yes, uh-huh. Um, and so when did things really get up and like, when did the phone, when did you guys get the phone installed there? Oh, that was probably in about September okay. of 1970. All right, so, and so when did things get fully up and running for, for the collective in a, in a sense? Almost immediately. Okay. Um, so some of the other things that we, uh, some of the other, up, uh, up, uh, some of the other activities that we took on were uh, to, to open a Sunday drop-in uh, location called the Gay People's Coffee Grounds. There was a, a little leftist group that had a small uh, apartment on the first floor of a building in, in the West 80s, and they had a drop-in center, which they weren't using on Sundays. So we approached them and said, could we possibly open this as a Gay People's Coffee Grounds on Sundays from uh, 2 p.m. to 9 p.m.? And it was coffee and sodas, and we uh, we pl postered all over the Upper West Side that there was a drop-in center, a social a social group on Sundays, not uh, an alternative to the bars. This was so important to us at the time because uh, we really didn't see the bars as a positive look, a positive institution in the gay community. It had been for years and years one of the only places that gay people could gather, but the bars were run by the mafia. They were uh, poorly run, they were dirty, 
They were overcharging us for drinks. They watered down the drinks. The police continued to raid the bars. And so uh, that's why the organization was so interested in having uh, dances that were not in bars, uh, having a drop-in center such as this one. Um, and so they were trying to create safe, safe havens and safe locations, especially when we got to the, uh, the community center that we opened, as I said, on West 3rd Street, that was open basically seven days a week and offer, began to offer even social services and uh, uh, spaces for consciousness raising groups, etc. That was a very big part of the program. Um, Did you, um... Police? Oh. Police harassment of bars did not stop in any way with the raid on the Stonewall. <clears throat> uh, there were continuous bar, bar raids. They, the mafia was paying off the police, but if there was some late payment, etc., they would come and they would harass the bar owners, and at the same time they would haul the, the gay patrons in. Um, it, it, that's a very... As I said in those days, and I'm, I'm really even still talking into 1970, 1971, <clears throat> the situation for gay people in America was was really dreadful. As I, as I, as I, uh, as I put it, we were on our knees in the confessional, we were on our backs for shock therapy, and we were standing in line for the mugshot that was going to ruin our lives. This this is what life was all about except in very, very rarefied places where somebody had enough money or enough privilege that they could live uh, or in a bohemian atmosphere in the theater or in something like that where there were these other little pockets in society where somebody was safe. For the ordinary gay and lesbian, it, it, was, a, it was a very dark, very dark time. And so, and so in March of 1970, one of the routine uh, bar raids uh, happened at the Snake Pit Bar in the village. Now, the Snake Pit was a, quite a big bar and very popular. And uh, whatever had happened, the mafia hadn't paid them off. They showed up in the early evening, and they arrested 167 men at the Snake Pit Bar and hauled them all off to the police station. You know, what was different about this one was an incident that occurred. There was a um, <clears throat> young man. Diego Vinales was his name, and he was from Argentina, and he was in the country illegally. Uh, Argentina was run by a military junta at that time. It was a, not a time to be, to be gay in Argentina. In fact, a little side story. I had a really good friend, uh, Jim Clifford, in GLF, whose partner named Angel was uh, from Argentina. His father was a military officer in the Junta in, in Buenos Aires, and he was in military school. This is Angel's story in Buenos Aires at this time. And he was caught in sleeping in bed with another student at the Argentinian Military Academy. They were immediately expelled and sent home. Angel's friend, whose father was a general, handed him a pistol and said, I want you to go and kill yourself. And he did. He went into the other room and shot himself in the head. Angel's mother, when she heard this, and fearing something was going to happen to her son, packed bags and flew him to New York City and to get him out of the country because she was afraid for his life. And uh, she left him with enough money to uh, be able to survive in New York. So luckily he met my friend Jim Clifford and they became a, 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 a couple. But that's really sort of the, the background for poor Diego Vinales, who was on the second floor in the Charles Street uh, police station, knowing that he's an illegal alien. And if he gets arrested here, he's going to get deported back to Argentina and they're going to know that he's gay. So he jumped out of the second floor window when nobody was looking. Uh, hoping that he would just be able to hit the sidewalk and run away. And unfortunately, there was a spiked fence around the first floor of the Charles Street Station, and uh, he impaled himself in his stomach right on the spike. Um, <clears throat> he survived, but they had to come with an acetylene torch and uh, 
cut the spike, get him to the hospital. And uh, the theory in the community, remembering the Stonewall riot, etc., for like four or five nights, hundreds of people gathered at the Charles Street Station protesting uh, these continued police raids. And of course, uh, with the thoughts of poor Diego Vinales. And so um, all of this, of course, is going at the same time. And with, were there other types of groups like the, like, like it's always been? There's one more police raid I could talk about. Okay. <clears throat> In August of 1970, I was, at, I was at the Sunday night meeting when a couple of fellows came to make the organization aware that there was a police crackdown happening in the Times Square area. Now, Times Square was also kind of a gay area, but we were village people. We didn't really know so much about what was going on in Times Square because it was a rough, there were porn shops, this was a different Times Square than people see in New York today. Um, and there was a certain amount of hustling going on and it was, a diff it was a different subculture in the gay community. But apparently the police had been cracking down and in the previous couple of weeks they had hauled away a couple hundred young gay uh, and lesbian, but mostly gay men uh, and these two Hispanic men came, said, and you know, they were standing on a, on a movie line and they got pulled in and this was happening all the time. They were just trying to clear all the gay people out of Times Square. So what could we do? So people said, well, we should, we should do something about this. Let's have a protest march on, Times, on 42nd Street. Um, and we contacted a few other organizations that had formed at that time, like the Gay Activists Alliance. And um, so you know, one or two Saturdays later, on a very hot August night, we, uh, we, uh, we had leafleted all over the village, come and join us in this protest march. It was in English and Spanish. I remember the, the flyers being all over the village. And we had a couple of hundred people that showed up. Uh, nine or 10 o'clock, Times Square, lots of signs. And we, um, we walked up and down 42nd Street from about 7th Avenue up to 8th Avenue, 9th Avenue. And we marched around for about an hour. Um, <coughs> <coughs> this was a pretty well organized march. Um, the 95th Street Collective, we had, we collective, we had volunteered to be marshals uh, to assist. We were watching the police. The police stood by during this whole march. They didn't take any action. Uh, the, the streets were very crowded that night with tourists and just people that were in Times Square. And they kind of watched uh, where there was a little hostile, hostile uh, language, but mostly people were just kind of amused that we were all walking around. And I think that the message was very strong that the gay, the gay community was concerned about this crackdown, it should end. Um, and the police uh, station was in that was in, that controlled the Times Square was in the West 30s. So after about an hour, the whole plan had been to go down to the police station in the West 30s and finish finish the rally there. So um, as we headed south from Times Square, it was a strange thing that almost immediately, within two blocks, all the bright lights of Times Square and the crowdedness all disappears, and you're on really very much deserted streets. And uh, so uh, three of us from my collective were right at, we happened to be the marshals that were leading the people down to, I think it was 38th Street or 37th Street. And as we started going down the block toward the police station, nobody's there except 12 or 15 policemen standing in front of the station with helmets and billy clubs, just standing there and kind of slap in the billy clubs on their hands. And we said, stop. This is not any place to take this crowd. So, um, and I take responsibility for this with some pride, I suppose. I said, well, let's, let's tell people to go to the village. Let's, let's say we gotta go to the village. Uh, so they, we started shouting, the three of us, to the village, to the village. And they took up the cry and this whole crowd of about two, three hundred people turned around and started down the avenue toward, toward the village. And uh, 
We got there 11.30 at night, something like that. This whole crowd of people, some of them still carrying their banners, and, and uh, we arrived in Sheridan Square. Where else would you go? Because you know, the site of the Stonewall riot, etc. And there were the police cars in front of a gay bar called The Haven on Sheridan Square. They were having a police raid this uh, hot August night. And who should, be, who should they be greeted with in the middle of this hostile activity? Two, three hundred gay activists have suddenly arrived. Well, it turned into a, another riot. It's, we call it the forgotten August riot. But it lasted eventually for four nights. The, uh, the, the people just poured out of the gay bars in the village and out of their apartments. Um, people who hadn't been active at the Stonewall riot said, we're going to be here for this one. Uh, rocks and bottles were thrown at the police. Uh, they, they brought in sirens, shrieked through the night. Dozens of more police showed up. There were all these lines of people being pushed this way, that way. It spread all the way down Christopher Street and onto 8th, uh, 8th Street. Car, cars were overturned. Um, store windows were broken. Uh, they started clubbing people. Uh, it was... It was an incredible evening, and people returned the next night and the next night to uh, continue. It was like a repetition of Stonewall, only probably more people than had been there uh, uh, in June of 69. And so <coughs> these, were the, the, these uh, protests were becoming more common, correct? Absolutely. Uh -huh. And what was, and so the, I'm trying, I'm, what was the, so you seem like, in a sense, Stonewall, do you believe that Stonewall was the precursor to that, or, or was that, did it had a direct impact on that sort of immediate activism in that next year, in a year and a half? Oh, absolutely, yes. I mean, Stonewall was kind of the cry. People used, remember Stonewall and, and uh, keep the fight from Stonewall going. So it was, it was definitely something that was in everybody's mind. And with regard to the collectives, um, were, had those existed before Stonewall? Oh, not before Stonewall, and not until really after the first gay pride march is when they started. So and a full year later, a full year later, as an outgrowth of the organization maturing and needing to get more work done, and more people really giving up their lives and deciding, I'm not. In fact, I didn't go back to school. I dropped out of graduate school that fall of 1970, I was too involved with gay liberation to think about going back to school. So I took a hiatus, and I had intended to return to graduate school the following year or the year after. But as a full-time activist until 1976, I, was, I didn't go back to school. I, I survived on odd jobs. Um, and uh, as many of us in gay liberation did, really, we, we just became full-time activists. Uh, we f we filled our days with uh, uh, meetings and uh, leafleting. It just really was. It was a very intense period. So how did this take over? Your, I mean, again, it's it's just like it, it. What was the reason that you you, you just mentioned that you dropped out of uh, graduate school? But what was the larger impetus for this? What was the what did you sort of feel? was the sort of imperative to be able to, for this to be the top priority in your life? <clears throat> well, I think for most of us, we simply weren't going to accept the lives that gays and lesbians had lived previously. Uh, there was just this, this sense of extreme fervor and dedication that we're going to change things. We're going to change them for ourselves, which I think was, you know, this, this uh, the thing about fighting for your lives. As gay people, we felt like we were fighting to make lives that were going to be different. It, it just felt, I mean, it was really the, the time period with feminism and with civil rights and, and all of this, that we just felt that same kind of uh, energy and dedication to making change that we saw in the other movements around us. And so, and also discuss, I saw briefly in your bio the, that you touched on intersectionality, um, you know, <clears throat> that you, especially with the advent of the feminist movement, of course, the, 
civil rights movement uh, not too long before. Can you talk about how the work you did during that time sort of touched on intersectionality and what that is for people that don't know what that is? Uh, many of us who uh, started in, in uh, who became activists in gay liberation had already been active in the women's movement, the civil rights movement, and uh, anti-war movement. There was no reason for us to stop our activity with these other uh, these other uh, uh, movements. We felt that uh, we were part of a, a broad change that was happening in American society at that time. Um, so we continue to care about the war and, and uh, to care, about, well, certainly about the women's movement. And, and uh, <clears throat> so we continue to uh, outreach to these other groups who were in the streets in those years and uh, very, very frequently showed up at, as I say, anti-war marches with gay liberation banners. Uh, um, and we had a, a rather major outreach with the Black Panther Party. Um, this is this feeling that we were part of a large movement. We cared about a number of, of uh, issues at the same time um, and had had past experience with them. Now, I think we briefly touched on the fact that there were other organizations. Another organization that formed in November of 1969 was called the Gay Activist Alliance. This group was the first of many uh, groups in the United States to focus singly on the single issue of gay and lesbian uh, liberation or activism. Um, they said we were spreading ourselves too thin. Um, they, I, I'm not sure that, I think they were concerned about other issues in America, but they thought it would be more effective if they solely focused on a single issue of gay and lesbian rights. <clears throat> So um, once in a while, for instance, we would have a joint demo. And so in November of 1969, oh, the actual dispute at the meeting was that the group had decided to um, uh, use some money from our dance treasury uh, to help a group. Go. That was the Free Panther 21. They were raising money for legal assistance to um, help them with legal fees of uh, members of the Black Panther Party who had been arrested. We made a $200 donation. And with that, the, this other group, the group of disgruntled people left and started the Gay Activist Alliance as a single issue. That really was a, an approach a number of other organizations started later with this other point of view. We said, why do we have to give up our support, public support, um, of movements that we uh, sympathize so deeply with. And so this kind of intersectionality, as it's called today, of understanding that there are lots of movements for change and that these people gain strength by working together is the approach that the Gay Liberation Front always took. And was the Gay Liberation Front, <coughs> uh, can you, how many African Americans or I guess, uh, what was the racial demographic <coughs> of GLF? Um, well, GLS sort of reflected the cross-section of, of gay and lesbian society in, in New York at the time. Uh, I would say that as an organization, it was, it was mostly male, it was mostly white, but there really were a good cross-section of African Americans, of Latino groups. In fact, one of the things that happened within the Gay Liberation Front was that identity politics uh, came to the front and there was a, a uh, what was it called, Gay Black Revolution Party, a group that within GLF, they stayed within GLF, but as, a, as an African-American uh, uh, cohesion, they, they, they had their separate meetings and they were with us in all of our demonstrations. Um, <clears throat> very importantly, uh, street transvestite action revolutionaries started um, in uh, August of 1970 with Marsha Johnson and Silver Rivera, longtime GLF members, who uh, thought that they would, they they also would benefit from having an actual named organization to represent their point of view. Radical lesbians also formed. It was a, you know, it was in fact a group of the uh, lesbians who had been involved with uh, the women's movement. Um, so this kind of fractionalization, at the time, it may have looked like it was. Um, 
it was, uh, <clears throat> some of them happened with a certain amount of stress and conflict, but in fact what it was was, was just, it was, a, it was a positive activity with uh, groups that, I say, broke off uh, because it made sense for them. And um, how, are we, how are we doing time on? Um, and so, what do you, so with the collective, uh, with, <clears throat> with, the, with the collectives that came up, uh, you mentioned that in that fall of 1970, um, they had started getting on the ball and started going with things. So what was the development of that? Because I think in the next year, some of them had disbanded that you had worked with. So if you could talk from that fall of 1970 to when, I guess, the group you <coughs> had disbanded, that would be great. Um, yes, well, um, some of these things had a sort of a natural life. Um, collectives, group, the original group of five, somebody left because of something that ha was happening in their life and a new member would form. Or s sometimes the space that was being rented was no longer available. So uh, most of the collectives, the gay men's collectives that started around June of 1970, lasted about a year or a year and a half. Uh, there was a new one that started on Staten Island a little bit later than the rest of us, and it lasted longer, as did the one in Brooklyn. Um, it, it had to do with the fact that, indeed, there was some burnout. After a while, people said, I've got to get back to school. I've got to get a real job. This hand-to-mouth is, <clears throat> is just not going uh, to last for, forever here. Um, so in the, at the same time as... Uh, as I say, some, some separate groups started evolving. Some of the core group, their, their lives, they just needed to do something else. Uh, so there was a, a kind of a, a cycle that we, we saw happen. The GLF, Gay Liberation Front, lasted until about the beginning of 1972. And at that point, a whole bunch of men moved to San Francisco. Um, the, 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 um, idea that San Francisco was going to be a much friendlier place with better weather and much less expensive to live in lured, oh, I think about 20 members of the male members of Gay Liberation Front within a very short period of a couple of months moved out to San Francisco and their loss was, they were very, very kind of prominent people. Their loss was felt. Um, so uh, in, a, in a way, People's personal lives just needed attention, and uh, uh, so much had been accomplished. I mean, in some ways, the mission of the Gay Liberation Front was established, was achieved within its first two years. There were about 200 gay and lesbian activist groups on campuses and in cities across the nation at the end of two years. People kept coming and visiting us in New York to seeing how this was working. Famously, the uh, two guys that formed the London Gay Liberation Front spent time in the, living at the collectives and coming to meetings, doing consciousness raising, and they went back to London and started the London Gay Liberation Front. Um, and they talk about that very openly. It was the visit to New York that spurred this on. Campuses around the country, of course, had people on, young men and, and women on, in the campuses that liked this idea immediately. Um, so in some ways, Gay Liberation Front had a natural uh, lifespan that was kind of its job was done at the end of two years. And, and that, in, in, in your opinion, the start of that process was Stonewall, <coughs> was Stonewall and, in a sense. And what do you think then the legacy of that period? Um, looking back, what do you think the legacy of that period from, from Stonewall in 1969 to the sort of disbanding of some of those initial early groups. What do you think the legacy is of, of those groups is today? It's <clears throat> a pretty major question there. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, one, it was to inspire people across the country that this, that this was a, a possible direction to take, that they finally could make their, their personal lives political. The personal is political. Um, and um, that uh, people very quickly started forming what you might call a gay and lesbian community. You know, within the first 10 years, hundreds of 
uh, businesses, newspapers, gay choruses uh, formed. There were neighborhoods that suddenly you'd walk down the street in, in Pittsburgh and you'd see there's the gay bar and there's a gay bookstore and there's a gay coffee shop and this whole business of there had never been a gay community before. Uh, and so part of what the Gay Liberation Front inspired was people to go out and come out publicly, come out of the closet, take this action, and, uh, and it ex manifested itself in uh, the establishment of so many um, uh, businesses, organizations uh, in cities across the nation. It, was, it just was this incredible inspiration to, the, to uh, individual gay and lesbians across the country to uh, come out and organize and uh, take personal actions to improve their personal lives, their own lives, and the lives of all of the other young people who were coming into the world as gay and lesbian in those years. And, uh, sure. and, the last, and this will be the last question. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, There's anything you think we missed or, or whatever, by all means, <clears throat> volunteer. You can volunteer now, actually. Or from, yes, or that. Uh, anything you want to add to that before we get to the, the other part? No, it's all right. No? Are you sure? Okay. okay. Um, all right, great. So we'll talk about then, uh, so when everything had disbanded around 72, you mentioned earlier that you were an activist literally until 76. So what was those four period, years like for you? <clears throat> One of the political directions that came out of Gay Liberation Front was for men to recognize that the sexism was really the cause of, of women's oppression and of gay, gay men's oppression. That uh, there, there was a, a, a good political um, theory or belief at that point that, <clears throat> that sexism, which is male supremacy and the, the, the way that uh, men control society, keeping women in place, keeping gay men in place. One of the reasons that gay oppression would uh, evolve is that men had to be in a strict masculine role and gay men deviate from it. They don't assist men in keeping women in place. They don't, they don't, they don't fit in the, in the scheme. Uh, they don't fit in the scheme as defined by religion, as defined by psychiatry, as defined many places by government. The position of women was that they had to be controlled by men. I'm talking about a span of thousands of, uh, thousands of years of the relationship between men and women and this odd place that gay men fit into because <clears throat> we don't support that system. Um, uh, we, uh, I joined with a couple of men who were very much tied to feminists in those days and um, <clears throat> We uh, wrote a piece, a very important document called the Effeminist Manifesto. It doesn't have to do about effeminacy. It has to do about men supporting feminism and why uh, the, uh, one of the evolutions of the politics that we evolved in Gay Liberation Front was to understand that by helping women or being, a, being partner with women in their struggle for putting an end to male supremacy, was a way in which we also could uh, reach a better position in human society. Now, as gay men, we also oppress women. Um, we're not free from, <clears throat> we're not guilt-free by any means that there were lots of um, conduct and behavior within the gay male community that was insulting and disrespectful of women. Uh, so we needed to work on that ourselves. So for about five years, we published a, a magazine called Double F, two Fs in a feminism, <clears throat> in which we espoused our, our ideas about uh, the, the battle against sexism as a gay man. And then today, um, and that, and then today, sort of what your, um, you know, your, I guess you can look back on your life, sort of give us a quick snapshot of sort of the active, a yeah, quick snapshot of, I guess, sort of what your activism consisted of, um, maybe from then till now, and then, and then sort of what because I want to know the larger impact that these, these, those whole core years had on you. So. I think I said that people began to look at, at their personal lives and, and seeing that they had to get back on, on 
track in some of, of some of their personal things. Uh, my good fortune was <clears throat> to find jobs in a couple of publishing companies in New York City. And I learned uh, the side of the business about marketing and circulation. Um, and when I met my partner in 1977, we shortly moved to California so that he could attend uh, graduate school at Stanford. And I met the publisher of The Advocate, the National Gay and Lesbian News Magazine, which was being published out of San Francisco at that time. And, um, <coughs> <coughs> And I, I got a first job with a legal publisher in San Francisco, but when I met uh, David Goodstein, the publisher, he said, why didn't you come to us? We absolutely need you. The advocate, uh, I'm inve he was investing a good deal of money to make the, pub the publication a national and important uh, news source for the gay and lesbian market. And uh, <clears throat> they had 3,000 subscribers at the time that I was interviewed, and I took the job and uh, became the marketing and did a tremendous amount of direct marketing. I es helped establish for the first um, gay mailing list exchanges that went on, and we began to do uh, a very difficult job of finding mailing lists that were largely gay and lesbian recipients. And within about 10 years, we had built the, sur the subscriber base to 75,000, which became a much more financially viable uh, situation for, for the company. I ended up working for The Advocate under six different ownerships for 33 years, always as the VP of circulation. Actually, I was the president and a part owner under one ownership for about six years. Um, but the AIDS crisis was really very, very difficult, very damaging to The Advocate. Um, we'd begun to receive, we'd gone glossy, we'd improved the quality, the costs were going up and they were had we had for the first time some serious national advertisers who were coming into the magazine to help pay the bills the AIDS crisis hit and unfortunately all but one or two national advertiser completely abandoned the gay market the financial situation for the advocate was very bleak so we began to publish actually I as <clears throat> I suggested we publish some additional titles and so we started men magazine, freshman magazine, unzipped and two magazine, adult titles um, that we could produce high quality. And it really, it saved, it saved the advocate that we started a whole new division. And then we were able a few years later to purchase our main uh, rival, our competitor, Out Magazine. Uh, so at our peak, we published about 10 magazines. Uh, the circulation of Out and the advocate it was over 250,000 uh, readership every month, every, and uh, it was a very long and satisfying career, which had evolved uh, as a combination of my involvement in the gay community. I was able to put it to work in a business environment, and uh, <clears throat> feel very, very lucky to have had a really a professional career in a gay environment, which wouldn't have ever been. A, possible for anybody else. So the reward for myself was to find yet another place in life that wouldn't have happened if uh, gay liberation hadn't happened. Oh, and so looking back on your life now, it's 2018, <coughs> and I think I've asked this question before to other folks. Um, what do you think the legacy is today for, for people <coughs> today coming up? Uh, what, why, does Stone, why should Stonewall matter to someone today? I know that many young people don't know the history of their own community, but if they, if they were to know that history, they would know that 1969 was an incredible breaking point, a change of, a change of life and culture for gays and lesbians in this country and the world that, um, <clears throat> I mean, they're the beneficiaries of it. It, it maybe would it would have happened maybe in a few years in some other way without, if there had not been a Stonewall riot, the time was right, and it really just needed people of, um, of, in, of uh, vision to step forward and say, clap your hands, this is the time to do it. And uh, I, I mean, it's, it's uh, I don't think any other community has made such advances in, the, in the, their life and culture as the gay and lesbian community has. And it really is exactly at that, at that point 
1969-1970 that uh, it was all it was accomplished. Anything else you'd like to add or, or say or, or um, to the to the topic or conversation? No, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh huh. <laughs> I hope that was okay. I, I let you talk. Yeah, that's, uh -huh. the, that's the point with the oral history interview. So, because it's first the journalism, you I would like cut cut it up. But no, this was great. This is okay. Yeah. Well, I hope I responded adequately. You were fantastic. Okay. Uh, thank you. Great. No, especially that that period. Those are. I mean, there's some great quotes in there, and just you know, you really did draw tie a lot of it together in a lot of ways for me personally, just to see to see that. So, and, if, and, they, and like you mentioned, just did they live in a gay environment and still be successful and thrive? And mm -hmm. stuff, so that was awesome. We'd love to get some shots of these photographs. Oh, yes, right. Uh, I'm going to take you, you just unhold it. <laughs>